funded by the Broad Landscape Partnership Scheme and the National Lottery Heritage Fund, myself and three colleagues at Norwich University of the Arts are currently contributing to a cross-disciplinary research initiative, which includes projects from archaeologists, geologists, historians, conservationists and biologists. Titled Mapping the Broads, the initiative aims to diversify and strengthen public engagement with the National Park. Through individual investigations, we are using illustration as practice, method and process to explore the landscape. Today I will be presenting my initial fieldwork and main themes that concern my research inquiry. By looking at the human sculpted waterways of the Norfolk and Suffolk Broads through the contextual lens of the Anthropocene, I aim to surface narratives of geological labour and social industry that are crystallised in the materiality of the landscape. Chalk, flint, clay, peat and sand have been structured and ordered through the quarrying and building, but in the same terrain, natural matter runs to reap the eroding edges of time. A flat landmass, once sitting under Pleistocene ice sheets, then a shallow sea, abandoned by glaciers, heaving themselves across the landscape. The broads are built on soft Jurassic bedrock, clay, sands and sandstone. Between these pressing layers, vegetation suffocates, shrinking and solidifying into peat. Extracted and cut by hands and arms to stoke the medieval churches in Norwich, the channels and trenches flood as the sea swells and rises. Agricultural action populates and cultivates land as it surfaces from the water, a new sediment washes in, mixing a mineral miasma. Materials are quarried, purified and separated, sorted ready for use in construction. In this initial phase of the project, I'm sifting through the landscape using film as an editable tool to capture, synthesise and illustrate the traces of human narratives deposited in the geologic topography of the National Park. Moving images can document the slow, quiet and micro-movements of time. The artist and critical writer Robert Smithson unpacks the process of film, viewer and sight, writing that scale inflates or deflates into uneasy dimensions. We wander between the towering and the bottomless, and we are lost between the abyss within us and the boundless horizons outside us. Any film wraps us in uncertainty, and the longer that we look through the camera, watch a projected image, the remoter the world becomes, yet we begin to understand that remoteness more. The Anthropocene is a proposed geologic epoch in which humankind shapes, affects and alters the earth, the marks of which could be casting future strata locked into the material memory of the planet's landscape. The term is not currently formalised, but it's being critically debated by scientists, philosophers, environmentalists, anthropologists and geologists. Jeremy Davies, in his book The Birth of the Anthropocene, published earlier this year, puts forward that the birth of the new epoch is precisely an opportunity to think about human and non-human power relations simultaneously. So my interest in the debate doesn't lie in the direct implications or the critique of the title Anthropocene, but in the range of different perspectives the plethora of disciplines are contributing to the critical unpacking of our current position and relationship to the planet. A convergence of global perspectives from political, artistic, journalistic, poetic, social, anthropologic, historic, economic, philosophic and scientific accompany the geologic in a rare opportunity to surface and make public current theories and speculations about life on Earth. Framed by these emerging critical discussions around the Anthropocene, I'm excavating and speculating on the role of illustration as a mediator, aiming to open the channels of engagement between faceless notions of deep time and a public that Davies insists are already overburdened with the weight of information available to them about the state of the planet. What is needed instead is some plausible way of coming to terms with the Earth's bewildering antiquity, now that climate change and species loss have forced the subject forward into public attention. The existing illustration that saturates the subject, appearing alongside articles, documentaries and book covers, are adorned with images of nuclear mushroom clouds, toxic waste trails and oil spills. These images are shocking and disturbing, but it is unlikely that they deepen our understanding and empower us with new knowledge that can contribute to such a critical debate. The audience for these images are the global masses, and they have signified doom and death and destruction since the latter part of the 20th century. 
They are not new, but signify through their cultural existence an already established narrative of the negative effect of humankind's relationship with the earth. But through this association, they can also remove us as a viewer. Not to say that these images and the phenomena they represent are important to digest, but perhaps it is easier to view these images as a spectator of global crises rather than to feel a stronger participant in planetary existence. Perhaps it is the default position of the art director to assume that we need a generic global image to speak to a generic global audience. But we can't continue to rely on a vocabulary that is over-established and desensitised through extensive repetition. In this presentation of fieldwork, I'm focusing on the landscape's materiality as a method of communication. And I refer to the term materiality not as the description of material as a tool to craft images, I'm defining it as a matter with its own agency, considering it a thing in the world. The buffet of existing matter that the landscape offers communicates naturally with its own references to cultural meaning, use and exploitation. Utilising human memory, the materiality of the broads landscape speaks of time and entropic processes that illustrate a dense and complex past and future. A Davies observes that the environmental catastrophe has politicised deep time. So how are people who care about the environment, but who are neither paleontologists nor glaciologists, supposed to deal with these vast expanses of history? How can they understand them, imagine them, or make sense of the day-to-day -day environmental changes that are placed in this startling context? We speak of time as something quantifiable to lose, something to gain, a resource to utilise, profit from and a portion. Time can be used, spent, wasted, carved and given. Time is a portal, a window. Time is transformative, simultaneously healing and ageing. Time is a vessel for events, experiences, stories, histories. We talk about time as slipping through fingers, days racing, months flying by. The minutes can also creep, seconds split and hours stretch. We are compelled to assign a movement to time, to see it as a viscous current flowing under the surface of life, a driving agent force. The term deep time refers to the expansive geologic time scale. Moving backwards from light to dark, like the descent into the ocean, or as a radio wave travelling through outer space, deep time reaches beyond our direct vision and into speculation. Perhaps our connection or fascination with the speculative takes us to the limits of our imagination. But like all good works of science fiction, the unfamiliar is always constructed on or in parallel with the familiar. Walter Benjamin writes that pure imagination is concerned exclusively with nature. It creates no new nature. So in order to digest a concept such as deep time, we can only use what we know as an anchor point from which we can reach out to visualise what we can only imagine. Benjamin writes that the work of memory collapses time. The word collapsed visually suggests that time is a form, bending and heaving under the material weight of memory. Memories are a range of densities, mixed from composite details, emotions and fossilised senses. The form warps and twists, reshaping as it grows longer, and our understanding of time continually changes as the memory matter flows into the form compounding and compressing. Sontag reflects on Benjamin's writings and concludes that memory, the staging of the past, turns the flow of events into a tableau. A small disturbance of sand could simultaneously speak of a foot breaking the tension of a freshly tidied beach or the edge of a construction site turning foundations, a sculpted dune in a playground or the carved vistas of a quarry. A crust of salt could equally tell the story of dinner table debris, Smithson's seminal spiral jetty, or the lick of a lip after a cold swim. A shard of flint is at first glance a prehistoric arrowhead, then a pebble-dashed wall, then a smooth sharpening tool. A lump of clay may equally resemble a misshapen ceramic pot, the soft strata in a cliff face, or Patrick Swayze straddling Demi Moore in Ghost. The Earth's material memory is perhaps easier to comprehend. Our own flesh is planetary matter, cast and recast through each generation of humankind. 
and earth landscapes are visibly stacked with memory matter, marked, carved, dug, scraped, burnt, moulded, cleared, piled and sifted by passing event and action. Smithson writes that the strata of the earth is a jumbled museum. Embedded in the sediment is a text that contains <coughs> limits and boundaries which evade the rational order and social structures which confine art. In order to read the rocks, we must become conscious of geologic time and the layers of prehistoric material that is entombed in the Earth's crust. When one scans the ruined sites of prehistory, one sees a heap of wrecked maps that upsets our present art historical limits. In the broads, time is present in the repetition of tiny movements and changes to matter. The break of surface tension flurries a scattering of refractions as air meets water and sunlight appears to define shadows for a moment, warming for a moment, and evaporation. A strand of blue-green algae sways to the swell of a wave, and rocks are dredged, discarded, and dragged back and forth in the tide. Roots of grasses and reeds loosen soil as they are nudged by the wind, and these movements repeat themselves. To witness these cycles is to begin comprehending geologic time. Transformation is an integral part of these cycles, and they leave us with a visual trace. Entropy is the measure of that transformation, of metamorphosis, the ordering and disordering of matter. Smithson writes, in other words, if we consider the Earth in terms of geologic time, we end up with what we call fluvial entropy. Geolo geology has its entropy too, where everything is gradually wearing down. And there is something so seductively apocalyptic about Smithson's entropic vision the resignation that by the forces of time, everything on the planet is slowly edging closer to an unstoppable and undeniable tsunami soup of matter. In 2014, Science Journal published an article which documented the findings of waste pl plastic objects, and these objects had fused with dense rock in the Hawaiian Islands. This plastic agglomerate found in the rock still carried a ghost form of recognisable objects, such as toothbrushes, forks and rope. Entering the rock cycle, the objects had undergone metamorphic processes of pressure and heat before drifting to the sea floor to pose amongst the sediment. Smithson prophesizes that the tools of technology become a part of the Earth's geology as they sink back into their original state, and machines like dinosaurs must return to dust or rust. Capturing visual traces of entropy in the Broads landscape takes the eyes to edges, crumbling edges of banks, eddies of sand under the lips of lapping water, surface currents, pipe torrents, submerged foliage, and pools brimming with eutrophic matter. And geo stories are epic tales to human eyes, and time runs differently here. It is slow, but micro movements hint at the macro epic as it unfolds. Benjamin writes that the materials of memory no longer appear singly as images, but tell us about a whole, amorphously and formlessly, indefinitely and weightily, in the same way as the weight of his net tells a fisherman about his catch. Materiality acts as a surfacer of memory and simultaneously a revealer of entropic journeys. By reading this, we can consider the past and the future in the present second of time. An illustration can allow us to time travel both back and forth in the same space. To consider time beyond ourselves and our own comprehension of human life. Materials of the landscape present themselves as a combination of matter and form, and the form is affected by entropic pressures. This is where the narrative starts to present itself. Through tacit associations, the materials impart their stories. In the Observer's Guide to Geology in Britain, Evans observes that we can see the significance of ripple marks on a sandstone, of a hardened ooze similar to that of the modern ocean floor, or of the abundance of rock bed of fossil sea creatures <coughs> or land plants. Through visual associations, we can form a physical dialectic, a discussion between two forms, pushing and pulling to reach a shared point of truth. The Norfolk Broads wind and unfold between city, town and sea. In the constructed gravel-lined broads, waterlogged channels cut through fields, ripping into rivers and dissolving into the sea. The prehistoric, the ancient, the old and the new converge. 
A quasi-industrial landscape of the Middle Ages, the sprawl of the broads was carved by large-scale medieval peat extraction pits between the 12th and the 16th centuries. Flooded and abandoned, foliage and reeds colonised the banks and hid these histories from sight until the 1960s. Now carved by the labour of quarrying, clustering around the edges of the National Park, piles of raw materials reveal a fabricated entropy, where time is controlled and fast-paced. Sand and gravel are appropriated, refined and spewed back into the topography of the landscape, morphing by the construction of bypasses, luxury flats and municipal monuments. Landscape is the architecture of labour, with human and geologic time interweaving. It is the inextricable product of this shared time, where matter cycles through modelling and remodelling. There is an opportunity to use the local landscape, a landscape we directly inhabit or interact with, as a place to digest and engage with a weighty global debate about the Anthropocene. Pryor, in his 2010 book, The Making of the British Landscape, observes that the landscapes of Britain are as complex as the geology beneath them, and it would be a mistake, however, to assume that geology simply dictates the form of the landscape that humans have created on its surface. Indeed, nothing could be farther from the truth, and the relationship of the one to the other is complex and can only be understood on a case-by-case basis. So to conclude, I'm going to return to Davy's question. How are people who care about the environment, but who are neither paleontologists nor glaciologists, supposed to deal with these vast expanses of history? How can they understand them, imagine them, or make sense of the day-to-day environmental changes that are placed in this startling context? Making sense of the day-to-day environmental changes requires us to inhabit and have a relationship with the landscape in which to contextualise them. This takes us from visualising through the wide global lens to visualising through the focused local lens. To comprehend the cultural histories of language, we might look to regional accents and dialects to surface wider narratives of cultural transience. In the same way, looking at focused areas of landscape, we can build a visual vocabulary that allows us to trace the moment of the movement of narratives that are only seemingly concerned with the surrounding square metre. When zooming out, these same local narratives can be accessed and engaged through the wider and weightier context of global debate. Like the Eames Studio iconic film, Powers of Ten, we begin with a scene one metre wide, which we view from just one metre away. Now every 10 seconds, we will look from 10 times farther away and our field of view will be 10 times wider. In the next phase of the research, I'll be aiming to extend my use and application of materiality and memory through film, entropy, time and objects to produce a physical dialectic that aims to facilitate a clearer comprehension of deep time, to engaging and encouraging access to a complex discussion that requires us to consider the past, present and future of this planet. Using illustration to provide a foundation on which to comprehend and empower a wider contribution to a global debate. The wider the range of voices and perspectives that can add to this critically questioning of the Anthropocene, the stronger the conclusions we will make as a global society on how we move forward into our future citizenship on Earth.